wanted to start off with a few things. Um, Marie Brar is the new farm advisor from Madera Fresno County. So we finally got one placed. He wasn't able to be here today due to a previous conflict. And, and so we're all kind of covering for each other, thankfully. Um, he is two days in the Madera office, three days in the Fresno office. So give a call to either one of those offices if you'd like to get a hold of him. He comes on a pretty high regard. He was uh, trained in horticulture out of Florida, worked in a little bit of citrus, but we brought him over to the, the nut crop. So he's covering almond, walnut, pistachio, or almond, pistachio, and walnut in Fresno, Madera County. Um, I still need it, and I'm sure he will probably say the same thing. We're only as good as you guys let us become. So give him a call, get him out in the orchard, and uh, let him see a bunch of different things so he gets some experience. And with that, he is hosting um, a meeting in Kerman, and I, I think it's June 12th. Uh, it's a Wednesday. I'm not 100% positive on that date. Maybe it's the 19th. All these days run together. It's one of those Wednesdays in the middle of June. There's a flyer up on the, up on the, the counter, so take a look there. Um, and we're gonna have a wide variety of topics covered in Kerman, and it'll probably be one of the first meetings in a long time that they had for Fresno. Uh, so I'm All sure right. you appreciate cool. the support. Okay. Um, and then finally, that's about it. So I thought today what I would I would kind of come in to do is, is talk a little bit about, I guess we're always concerned about nitrogen, but how that rolls into later season disease management. And kind of an issue that I'm starting to see is maybe some bigger management that we have to kind of wrap in dependent upon where we're sourcing our water from. And that may be out there a little bit because, um, you know, we're always trying to grow trees as big as possible, um, but you'll see how it all tie in. How many are pumping from groundwater this year? I'm assuming quite a bit, yeah, based upon districts. Have you guys done any nitrate nitrogen analysis of your water? In the process. In the process. So, one nice thing about groundwater, <laughs> other than the fact that it can contain unwanted salts, but one of the wanted salts it may contain is nitrate nitrogen. And that is a great source of nitrogen for your orchard. It's no different than applying nitrate fertilizer. So for every part per million nitrate in your water, take that times 0.273 times every acre inch of water applied, and that's how much nitrogen you're applying. So you have 10 parts per million nitrate nitrogen, you're applying an acre inch of water, you're getting 2.7 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it's probably gonna tie into some of these later season water management ideas that come when we start trying to manage fall rot. And we do know from a lot of experiments over time, as well as probably you guys know from firsthand experience, when you have really higher, highly vigorous trees, you're dealing with an issue of fall rot when you come into the hall split period of non -parel. And what I kind of see from the, re the data, even though it's not as clear as what we see, but when you get those real high leaf nitrogen values, over 2.8, 2.9, 3, 3.2, 3.3, sometimes higher, you know, you tend to see a gradual increase of haul rot. And we also have shown that with increased applications of nitrogen fertilizer to the soil. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to apply nitrogen to your orchard. What, I'm, what I'm, I want you to think about is think about bigger management as we approach that haul split period. So one, we do know if we reduce the amount of nitrogen we apply to an orchard, we can reduce the amount of haul rot. And if we also reduce the amount of water as we approach haul split, we can reduce the amount of haul rot. And what do those two things do when we reduce those two things? We reduce growth. And in essence, we're trying to make that tree less conducive to infection by controlling those environmental aspects of it. Roll that back around. Why did I ask about groundwater and, and amount of nitrogen in groundwater? If you're pumping it through July at your hull split period and you're pumping on tremendous amounts of, of nitrogen with your water, you're gonna have a lot harder time managing that. If you have any ability to switch over maybe to district water during that hull split period, it might be something you wanna consider and plan for at this point um, because it'll allow that to actually occur. So I want to bring that point up. So going back to hull ride, I, I would normally, in, the, in any other previous meeting, I've, I've sat here and talked about rust or scab, but this year with really the reduction of rain, and it's been pretty dry, so the reduction of humidity, I'm kind of just going to jump right to what we're, what we're doing with hull rot. And you, some of you may have heard this sermon before, so I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry. 
So think of haul rod as a three-legged stool, and this is independent of, of varieties. We do know some varieties are more susceptible, and we don't necessarily know why, but think of, think of your management of haul rot based upon your water, your nitrogen, and then, of course, a fungicide application if needed. So you know the history of your haul rod in your orchard. You know how vigorous your trees are growing. So that probably has something in, in your mind. You're saying the, the harder I push these trees, the more crop I get out of these trees, the more haul rot that I see. Most of that's kind of directly related as you guys would probably think of it. So coming in to, to, to our, our kernel fill period towards the end of May, I always try to encourage people to get out their spring applications of nitrogen as we, their last application of nitrogen this spring should be when we hit kernel fill. And you may say, why? I know I can apply into that first week of June and maybe even later. Well, the reason is, is I'm, after we get kernel fill, all that nitrogen is gonna start being re, redistributed into the hull. And in that hull, now you're essentially fattening up this hull. And you probably heard me say it before, hull rot's the gout of almonds, as Bet Tefiadale will say, but it's also, it's like putting a fat kid at a buffet line when this nut opens up for those spores that are naturally in, in the environment. So, try to target to reduce nitrogen applications as you approach kernel fill, which means you're probably putting on heavy, higher applications in this May period. You can determine kernel fill because it does vary year by year by cutting your nut in half and, and seeing the jelly slowly disappear over time. So when that kernel's completely full and you have a little bit more input out, that, that should be your trigger for your last application for until the post harvest, for the season until post harvest period. So that's one practice we can implement. Is it gonna prevent haul rot? No, it's not gonna prevent all of your haul rot, but it will help reduce. All these things will help reduce. The next, next aspect is irrigation management. And the reason why I'll preach this, the same as Dave Goldhammer preached it, the same as Brent Holtz preached it, the same as, as everybody you probably hear us is, is we've shown it time and time again, and predominantly in my area, we never had a problem with haul rot until we went into more um, micro or low volume systems we're putting water on more constantly. When it used to flood and these trees always stressed, we never saw a lot of haul rot. Well, they're always were stressed. That's probably why we never saw a lot of haul rot. So, as we approach haul split, the, the, the problem is, is when we see haul split, that's when we start triggering our, our water deficit. What we actually want to do is tr have that water deficit where we have the stress applied, a medium stress applied when that nut begins to split. So usually that means probably somewhere about a week before we, we start getting clear suture development, we're cutting the water back. So I kind of give people this general cookie cutter approach because we all like things to be relatively easy, but it, you're gonna have to tailor it to your own orchard. As you come into, you start seeing maybe the blanks on the outside of your tree split, cut the water back, and on that application apply about 50% of ET. If you come into the hull split period and your trees are wilting, you probably need it to apply a little bit more. Well, that's looking back. So what that means is, is probably apply a little bit more for the coming week. We want to impose that stress for two weeks, the first two weeks of hull split. So we come in, we apply 50%, we look at our trees at the end of the week. If they're wilting terribly, we probably want to apply maybe 70% of, of our demand the next week. We want to try to give them into that moderate stress range. Without a pressure chamber, this is very difficult, so I'm trying to give you some physiological aspects to look at the tree. That tree, the top of it, if it's been relatively well watered all the way through, um, and it's it's gonna wilt around negative 20 stem water potentials, negative 20 bars. I know if you don't have a pressure tamer, it doesn't mean anything. When we try to do pole rot management, we wanna put it at negative 16. So you can see we're stressing those trees a little bit more when we get it to wilt, so that's why we wanna to try to avoid it. If you're one of those people who think you're irrigating properly and your trees are wilting at the end of the haul rot period, you don't need to cut your water. So it gives you an idea that you're, you're, this, is, this is a little bit of the stress that you're trying to apply. So two weeks, usually the first week it's around 50%. The second week it comes to probably around 60 to 70% of water application. And then after that two week period, when you're, when you're getting into your, your hull split application, you can go back to fully irrigation. And the reason why you go back to fully irrigation is because if you continue to stress this tree, you'll prevent the formation of that abscission layer between the nut and peduncle, which will lead to stick tights, and you also will suck moisture out of your kernel, which will eventually lead to lost weight at the processor. So, 
that's kind of the, the, the quick and dirty application of irrigation management to help manage hull rot. Will it work 100% of the time? No, it won't work. Or is there a lot of room for error? Yes, there is. So it takes it takes a little bit of finessing. But you know, this is when you guys are probably in your orchard the most frequently for the year as well, because you're out there for hull split sprays, you're out there for um, trying to figure out when to schedule your, your harvesting and those types of aspects. So you, you are gonna have more visibility and you can maybe add this to the list of things to do. That's just what we're good. I'm like your nagging mother, right? Um, so, going on to the third, the third leg, and this is treating um, the use of fungicides. And I think, I think a lot of people have kind of relied on this as we're trying to scratch our head to figure out how we can work through our process. And just like any uh, fungal pathogen, if we make this application too late, there's going to be no value to making the application. So there's going back to the whole thing, there's two different pathogens of hull rot. One's a monolinea species and one is a rhizopus species. The black bread mold is the rhizopus. So you have to kind of know what you're working with. Usually in this area, it's the rhizopus. If we have a real high humidity year, a real damp year, we tend to see more of the monolinea. The monolinea will be gray mold on the outside of your hull versus the rhizopus will be the black mold on the inside of when it splits. Why I'm differentiating those two? They have two different means of, of prevention. With the, with the monolinea hull rot pathogen, we're actually making that fungicide application back when we do our scab timing and our rust timings now, essentially five weeks after petal fall to about mid-May. That's when we're controlling brown, that monolinea pathogen for hull rot, which is probably a good thing you don't have it because that'd be another application at this time of year. Hopefully you guys don't see it. We have a little bit up north and as you go further up north into the delta, that seems to be more of the kind of has more of an instance in that area. With the rise of bush, you probably heard this before, um, the application for that needs to occur when you're just getting the initiation of the hull split. And why at that time? Well, we need to protect those tissues that are beginning to tear. So when this hull splits, it's tearing those tissues and it's fresh and it's, it's just waiting to be invaded. And that's exactly what happens. Rhizopus stolonifer is all over the place. And so if we can kind of control this as this hull begins to split, get an application on there, we can reduce the incidence of hull rot. Jim Atascavich has went through and inoculated hulls at different points through the hull split period and hull split initiations when we get the infection with the rhizopus. Um, now, so we're, we're thinking, okay, this is great news. We have, we have the ability to control rhizopus by making an application until instead of hull split. And you probably heard the use of um, these Intrepid and Belt and Alticor being very effective for navel orangeworm at that time period as well. That's true. You probably get a nice double ride or double application at that time. And I think that's why a lot of people are looking for fungicide application for hull rot because it's easy. We, we mix in a product and we get control. The other thing is, with, with this pathogen, since it's kind of a general list, it's not a very, I, I should say it, it's not a, a very tough pathogen or so much around, um, just about any fungicide does the trick that we can apply at that time of the season. So you don't need to roll out the red carpet and buy the most expensive, expensive fungicide to apply at that time you probably will get pretty good control with some of the cheaper products that are coming online. And if you have any questions, we have it in our updated efficacy table, so take a look on there on the UCIPM website. But you know, generally strobularins and DMIs are gonna do, our, do the job for us. The reason why I, I, I really express a lot of caution with the use of fungicides um, at this time period is because when we talk about resistance management, we may not be concerned about hull rot, we may not be concerned about rust, but we are concerned about alton area and scab, which tend to be higher, higher populations within the orchard at this given time. So what do I mean by that? Well, remember, resistance is a numbers game. There's always a resistance population out there, somewhere, somehow, because there's billions of these spores and colonies everywhere in these orchards. So by applying a fungicide, we kill everything that that fungicide kills, except for the ones that it doesn't. So we essentially select for resistance to that fungicide when we make continual applications. Probably remember this with the glyphosate in weed talk. 
So if given the, the chance, those spores from that, the, the children of that resistant colony will spread and begin to infest the orchard. And if we go through and continually select for that, we, we're not killing that resistant pathogen. And that's why we rotate fungicides. So we move to a different mode of action to, to knock down that population as well. When we come in at, at hull split, we essentially have a very high endemic population in these orchards. It just spreads gradually through the season. So we make that application to a very high population of rust and scab and alternaria. In essence, we select for resistance to the, that, that product we're using. So, again, make sure you're rotating your chemistries when you do this. And if possible, try to not make that application if you, if you're able, if you don't have to. One, it'll save you a little bit of money. I want to also add, you're going to see more hull rot on non prel than you probably will on your later varieties. So if you get really bad hull rot in your non prel you probably can skate by by not treating your other two later varieties. Let's say Carmel non prel or Aldrich and, and Aldrich and, excuse me, Carmel Monterey or maybe Aldrich and Monterey. So use your experience and realize that Monter our non prel is always going to be the most affected with hull rot. Um, Okay, so any questions on that? What's that? Monterey or non -pro? The non pro is the most. Did I, mix, oh, did I mix that up? In my head, I'm saying one thing. Maybe I'm saying something different out here. Um, I'm too young for that, you know? Where's Walt? I was making fun of him. Um, yeah, so your non pro is your most, most, uh, most effective. You know, last year I went down to um, Australia and uh, I got a chance to tour the orchards. I talked a little bit about prune rust, so don't worry. We have that one, I think, pretty much whipped if you make the applications. Um, but they have hull rot just out of wazoo. Any, any guesses? They're getting it in their Monterey. They're getting it in their Aldrich. They're getting it pretty much in all the varieties. Any reasons why? You guys' thoughts? I can tell you my perspective, but... Humidity. A little bit of humidity. They have more in-season rains. <coughs> they also push a lot more vigor. So they're running. Are the canopies, canopies closed? Yeah, they're, they're closed, but it's very vegetated. It's very vegetative growth, and it's, a lot of it's due to the vigor they're pushing. Little air movement. Little air movement, and all these things kind of play into the fact that you're not pushing out this humidity produced from these orchards. What you're wondering where humidity comes from, grab the leaves, and you can feel it. So <laughs> they also think that you have to have your leaf end at 3%. So that's kind of where we feel that they're probably spurring a lot of growth and also increasing the, the susceptibility of these hulls by overfeeding them. Going back to that leaf nitrogen, <coughs> we've, we've shown this again, it was back in the 1980s with Warren Mickey, it was demonstrated again just recently with Patrick Brown, that our minimum, our minimum leaf, mid-July leaf value at 2%, 2.2%, excuse me, 2.2%, you're above the critical value. But the big problem is, is when you select one block at 2.2%, that means half your trees are under and half your trees are over. Right. So what, it, what, what that means is we're all thinking, okay, if we keep adding in, we continue to see a, an increase in growth, and you do. So I'm not gonna tell you not to because you're getting the yield in production. But somewhere around 2.5 to 2.6, depending upon how good you sample your trees, if you sample 30 trees 100 yards apart and you're at 2.5, you can feel about 99% confident that all your trees are over the critical value. So what I'm getting at is if we sample in mid-July and we have our trees way up in 3%, I think we can probably back off a little bit in the post-harvest to try to bring those trees gently down. We don't want to cut it cold turkey. Trees are very, they're very conservative and they don't like changes. So back it down slowly if we realize that's where we are. Um, now moving on, any questions on hull rot before I... I yeah, the, the monolinea you said we should be actually treating now if we had monolinea? Yes, so you're essentially if you're making a scab or a rush treatment... Which I already did, it's too late. Well, how long ago? You said 10 days? About 10 days ago. Yeah, you're, you're making an effective treatment for monolinea. It's just all the way through May is kind of that timing for, for monolinea. Okay. And the reason is it infects the hull versus the in infecting here. Okay. So you're, you're actually covering the hull to the protect gray, it. I got the gray stuff all over the outside of the, the hulls. Yeah, and, and you may want to, I mean, especially, so the question is, you know, if you have monolinea, you know, the timing, it's all the way through May. And you know you can also look at a rust application will provide pretty good control of that monolinea pathogen. 
if you're looking to make an application or you're looking for an excuse to make that application in your case. Um, so you, yeah, that's definitely infecting the hall and it just becomes prevalent. It's kind of quiescent until we get to this point of, um, of hall split. And I will say that it caught Jim out of scavenge by surprise in many regards of, of seeing control back in May. But it looks to be, if you did it two years in a row, it seems to be that's about the right time. One theory here a couple years ago, you need to do like two weeks before a whole split, and then another one after all split for, for the two different species. But so you, they're coming way back from that then. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say most people, most, I'm not saying all, most people have the issue with one or the other. And it's about controlling the one that you have. And you know, it's also very important is these spores are coming just about from everywhere. So when you drive through your orchard around that hall split initiation, you create a lot of dust, you're also stirring it up. So not that I want to tell you to drive two miles per hour because you won't listen to me, but the slower <laughs> you go, the less dust that you kick up. Um, also keep that in mind as a possible consideration. And you're gonna increase your, your uh, uh, efficacy with your insecticide sprays as well. Hey David? Yes. So is it air movement or sunlight or my ultimate question is would hedging in overgrown or large grown trees reduce this situation? So boy, thanks. Um, I think it would well, help. I have the problem. I, I think and all the lower limb die back and yeah. And we're thinking we're gonna hedge and open up these middles. But what is it that really helps? So, so definitely, the more you can reduce the canopy humidity, the interior humidity of your orchard, I feel very comfortable in saying the less haul rot you will have. So I think that's why under, when you stress those trees with irrigation, I think that's why it works. Your, sto your stomates close when they're stressed, and therefore there's not as much humidity in the orchard and it kind of vents out. Question about hedging, is you have an over, overgrown canopy, I don't, I always tell people the goal of an orchard, of a mature orchard, is shooting for probably two to three feet of light on the floor for management purposes. And and it's not necessarily for yield, because you're not going to yield more doing this, but I also right. see the benefit of if we get an early rain or getting that crop on the ground because you want to harvest early where you can get enough sunlight to dry it out. Um, so yeah, I think there's there, there probably will be a benefit from hedging and you also will see a benefit of also helping you increase your dry and reducing concealed damage potentially as well. So I would consider it and you are going to take a little you are going to take in the shorts a little bit when you cut those trees and you're probably you know what kind of pattern do we prune do we hedge it like walnuts like once every third once every third year or once every other year? You know, I don't know what's or alternate. best. Yeah, I don't know what's best, but my guess would probably be about every other year versus every third year, somewhere around there. But I don't know for sure. Um, well, I hate to lose so much production down here, but it, it just occurs. Um, the other thing too is there's, you know, when we used to think hedging, it was just straight cuts. Yeah. Now we have the ability to skirt, you know, cut this way, you know, pretty much do anything we want. So. You know, there may be there may be some gain by skirting it where you can actually get better light penetration down lower. And but you know, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I yeah. Well, well David, does the tree on the top compensate for the whole rot loss on the bottom? I mean does it really cut yields that much? You know, <laughs> that is another good question. Is this like the lower limb dieback issue where you know it looks horrible, makes us feel bad, and yeah, we maybe see some we, we may point a finger at it and suspect yield loss. Um you know, this is my internal argument. If I tell you guys not to apply nitrogen to reduce your hull rot, or you actually in water, you're gonna negatively impact your growth and cut your spur production, which is, yeah, but you know what I mean, which is, but I would probably say, I don't know. That, that's a good, that's a very good economic question. I don't know, I don't know. You know, we, we tend to be very reactive, you know, when we talk about management. And so we wanna control what we're seeing. Um, I would probably say if you're starting to see hall rot strikes 10 feet, all the way up to 10 feet into the tree, maybe higher, you you, you probably need to do a little bit. Unless you got a 30, 40 foot tree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, we don't do that in Merced. Only you guys on the west side can grow trees like that. You know?
They shouldn't say that too many Merced growers are here. But, um, but yeah, I think, so this is where it's going to tie back to a little bit of vigor management um, when I get to that sermon. But the other thing I want to cover real quick is, is that first application in post-harvest, we used to always kind of wait till post-harvest to make that application. So we try to shake the non prel and we irrigate and we fertilize. And then we're, you know, coming in, maybe shaking Carmel's two weeks later. But one thing to keep in mind is once that abscission layer forms between the peduncle and hull, we can probably, that nitrogen is going to be going into the tree, not into the hull. So we can essentially probably move maybe our first nitrogen application. Instead of waiting till we're done with the Monterey, we probably can come in to once we have hull split on the Monterey and use that as a timing of our first nitrogen application. So to give you an idea, maybe getting in a little bit earlier so we can get some nitrogen on when these trees are active. And that bud development period is occurring somewhere around the end of end of August, you know, beginning to end of August. So we're trying to get these trees a little bit more pumped up to reduce stress. So there's another opportunity that you may be able to get into the orchard a little earlier. If you have the ability to segregate your lines, as soon as you're probably in a hall split of non perel you can ear, you can fertigate your non perel but I'd probably hold off on the other two varieties until we get into the hall split period. And what do I mean by that? Remember, hall, that net that hall rod infection occurs at the splitting, the time of splitting. So once that period is over and then that's opened up, we're not necessarily at, at severe risk for hall rot. So that's why I'm saying we can maybe get back into those orchards. Okay, vigor management. My rootstock block, um, I have, the, I have the, the pleasure of working with a farmer who, who loves rootstock trials and he's willing to suffer through them. And I, may, may, may God, I, I'm, I don't know how this guy does it. I'm impressed. This is the second one with the extension service. He did one with Lonnie and then one with me. But what we're seeing in him, this is a well watered block, not a well irrigated block. So we're watering from groundwater and we have about 20 parts per million nitrate nitrogen in the water. So these trees are getting tremendous amounts of nitrogen. We calculated somewhere around 80 or 85 pounds in the first year, somewhere around 100 and something last year. So he's been pushing the water as well as with that comes the, the, the nitrogen. So these trees are, are big. They're about the size of this tree here, I'm not kidding you, in their third leaf. And they have absolutely no crop on the tree. So I was all excited. I was like, man, I'm gonna bust the doors off this. I'm gonna get like 800 pounds in the third leaf, you know? And we're going to lucky if we get 300. And so why? Why does that occur? Why does pushing vigor have that ability to reduce yield? And the so energy goes to the vigor. The energy goes to the vigor and the tree's not stressed. So it's only going to feel the need to reproduce. I hate to humanize it. It's only going to feel the need to reproduce when it's stressed. So it's got to keep growing vegetatively until you're able to pull back on the throttle a little bit. So. If you're in that situation where you can't control the amount of nitrogen you're giving to your young trees, the only way you can do that is by pulling back the water and trying to stress these trees a little bit. So keep so that in many, mind. How many that people too much, do that? What's how that? many people do that with a young tree? I That's mean. something I'm going to pitch to you guys, and you can tell me I'm crazy, but really, I, I don't know how we're going to manage the situation when we become more reliant on groundwater and we're more nitrogen than we want. I mean... Yeah. You know, we, we know when we fertigate and we're using relatively clean water, what we are buying and injecting is what we're putting on the field. But when we're pumping from the water, we can't control that. So we're, we're going to be battling this in this plot. And, and I just thought I'd bring it to your guys' attention that I think, and this is a very common observation what people say about young orchards in Australia. And I didn't see this, but, you know, they have really nice, big, lush, vegetative green trees, but they don't have a lot of crop on them. And I think a lot of that has to do with not developing that vegetative bud. And then I also then flip that over, is if you have a younger tree that you're developing and you have a light crop, and you come in and try to push the fertilizer on it, you're gonna get a lot of that whippy growth, that straight growth right through the center of your tree. And that may set a lot of blind nodes, and that's not gonna set you crop. So remember, if you don't see the crop on your trees, they'll pull back on the throttle, especially when it comes to end. The David, nitrogen application. Tell Australians that looks really good. I did. You pumping it to it. They, they don't listen to me. Low yields down. Trust me, they weren't listening to me anyway. They're listening about disease of uh, uh, rust management, but they uh, they were pretty content on what they were seeing. But um, how, how were those three-year-olds pruned? So we went after the first year. This is actually good, 
good information to it, the windstorm. They went and pruned to a three scaffold, and we pr they had to prune them hard because he's like, Dave, I think these trees are just going to fall apart if we don't prune them hard. And we're making cuts about this big on those scaffolds. Wow. And so then they took off last year, and this year we're getting breakage all over the place. Because now where you cut, you're getting five or six branches, and those are starting to break out. And, and now you, you essentially are on this treadmill. So I, I'm really, this is one of these things, guys, I don't know what, what I'm going to do with this they, plot. And they if they monitor something, the other nutrients to make sure that they, it wasn't just all in there getting on there, or to keep it, I mean, equilibrium, basically, or whatever? Well, they didn't put any nitrogen on, but they tried, I, I, they, didn't, they did not probably apply heavy doses of calcium or heavy doses of potassium. Everything was just kind of done, maybe a single application of a little bit of potash, maybe a little bit of, of, of gypsum, but that's about it. And I say that because that was kind of his mentality going into the first couple of years, is backing off those those other majors. You know, a lot of people just think it's pushing nitrogen on these trees. Right, but if, you, if they're not in equilibrium, then you do get that excess, all that excessive growth. And, and I think a lot of it too, and, and it's water. I mean, the quickest way to stunt your young tree is to not water it enough. And I think if, I mean, that's the, the, the other component is he kept these trees probably over watered or above watered. I don't know if you can do such a thing. And they never really slowed down through the year. So they just kept growing and growing and growing. What rootstock is that? I'm seeing it on just about every rootstock. Nemegard, Imperium One, Hansen. Every rootstock I have, I'm having a problem. The trees that look the best, or the the less the quote less vigorous rootstocks, so the root pack R, which is a plum cross, uh, the crimson eighty six, which is a plum plum almond cross, and do you guys heard this start this story before too? But you know, it's it's all about managing vigor to what you want to expect out of the tree, and we can make up for all those differences in size of rootstocks by just changing the spacing in our orchard. So, you know, maybe after. I worry about Crimson 86 because it doesn't carry root knot nematode, but maybe in this situation it might be a better root stock to go with. You know? N nothing I ever would have told him before when we planted this orchard. So um, I just thought I'd kind of comment on. What about the minimal pruning style where you, where the tree is trying to grow six, seven, eight primaries instead of three or four? Uh, do you get so much growth at each primary that way, or does it slow the, that down? So it, it's it's um it's a little bit of both. It seems to slow it down at certain times of year, and then you'll actually get a little bit of increased vigor at other times of the year. Because essentially, once once that branch forms, it almost becomes semi-autonomous. So it's developing its own carbohydrate load that's pushing the growth of that branch. But in the springtime, it slows it down because now it's relying on reserves of the tree that's getting directed into more points of growth. So the net, the net gain is actually less because it, it's lagging out in the beginning and right. it's catching up at the end of the season. So the leaving multiple scaffolds, you know, I, I would say it depends to me, is it a good thing to head back at the end of the second year, which is what he did. So he cut it hard after the first year, came in and cut it hard in the second year. You know, I, I don't know. We're starting to question all that anymore. Um, we do, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that if you leave a, eight, nine, ten scaffolds on your trees, you're going to have a lot more breakage as you get along. And, and I've seen orchards completely fall apart, you know, fifth and sixth leaf. So I, I would say five or fewer as a rough guidance. I prefer the three, but, you know, that just may be what I've seen trained and what I like to see. But I think you can leave more, but you want to space them out. And the reason those trees fall apart is they got a lot of wood, but they also get a lot of included areas. So that branch is only as good as it's able to connect to that trunk. And so the more branches you have, the quicker they grow into each other. And where they grow in, it's just like a scab. It doesn't grow into it, it just hits and stops. And so essentially you have less wood connecting it to the trunk of the tree. And I think that's why you gradually see these scaffolds continue to break out of these orchards. You know, if you're planting a 15-year orchard and you don't care if it lasts past that, then I say leave as many scaffolds on as you want. But if you want that orchard to last 20, 25 years, I think you need to prune to fewer numbers. Um, our, our neighbor just put some trees in and it looks like 
there's multiple, but they did go through and sort it out and probably like what you're saying, if they're really close, you know, take one out. Now third year, they they look really good, but it's only the third year. Well, you know, the, the early return, the economic return on early yield, I mean, it, it's, it's a sorely missed and highly discussed issue with our economics department. Yep. You know, what's, what's the better route to go? Yeah. And in terms of making money, so I, I know. Don't worry. I see it. I it blows. It's it's a very interesting discussion. Um, any thoughts going back to kind of whole rot management, nitrogen management as we come? I know we released these new early sampling protocols, and and you're probably not. No, he's here. I'm throw something. I mean, you're probably not going to get that model ran from your your local leaf sampling company who's processing your leaves, maybe you are, um, but you'll need to look online to do that, to get those models. And the difference between the model and the what you're probably getting, let's say, from a laboratory, is the model is a predicted value of what mid-July will be, versus what you're getting from the laboratory is what the leaf is, and a range that they have established as what they feel comfortable where your tree should be. So. That's the two distinctive differences. The other thing I want to point out is if you put your, if you're all excited to do this early season sampling protocol for nitrogen, it's only good for just that nitrogen. It's not going to tell you much about potassium. Actually, it's not going to tell you anything. And the reason is, it's a very, they can't figure out the algorithm or the correlation to get us potassium in mid July. They're able to do it very consistently with nitrogen. So you can take that sample with the full leaf analysis put it in and you can probably be about spot on to where you'd expect that orchard to be in mid-July if you're applying enough nitrogen to meet the demands of the crop. If you compare that to what you get from you know A&L, Dalla Valley, you know they're going to give you kind of guidelines where they think you should be and I'll probably tell you based on what I've seen they're probably within the ballpark and that's probably where we need to be you know within that ballpark and then we slowly tailor up to the orchard as we we get to that point. So I uh, just want to make sure that was clarified uh, because I, I think some people thought they were getting the early sampling protocol and I don't know if it necessarily always has been that way. Um, you have to go online to use it unless it's specifically been ran by the company for you. If you don't know what that is, come come talk to me. If you maybe do you guys know what that is by the way? I know it's been yeah. flogged in the media a lot, so um, any thoughts, questions, throw sticks at me? One thing uh, on your growth management and with the mold, red mold and everything else, and the, the nitrogen and the on to the tree, in flood irrigation, we, I've been doing, I flood every row through mid-May. And then after that, then I alternate uh, every other row. The, the, and does it help? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, because you put that little bit of stress in there, you don't have all the humidity in there, and it seems to work. Okay. That's actually good. that's actually good to know because those guys with flood, it seems like they struggle a lot. Yeah. I'm trying to figure that out. Well, I did have a problem. It almost destroyed the orchard. You know. Uh, yeah, no, it seems to be working. And you know that to add on to that, your question about, you know, if you prune, are you cutting more off? I've I've been in orchards where you had four to five hundred strikes per tree, and it, it can kill sizable wood. I mean, if you have a minor hall rot problem, you know, that's probably not the major issue. If you have a a major hall rot problem, it sounds like you did. I mean, it, it needs it needs to be you need to come at it with more than just fungicides. Is is kind of my fear of some of the messages being delivered by some of my colleagues. But thank you, that's a good point. So I don't know if you guys heard that he floods, so he moves to every other row in summer to put a little bit of stress on the trees instead of going every row. Any other questions? You guys are gonna let me off that easy, huh? Wow. 
What causes some of these nests to already look like they have a suture? I have no idea. That is... You're no help. I know. Boy, I said that a lot today. Um, so the question is, on Padre, you kind of see the suture development? That's a characteristic of that variety. I have no idea why we see it. I have no idea. That's just... And it's funny because you'll see it form and then it'll kind of close back up and then it'll reform again. I have no idea what's going on. I look at that a lot and I give myself a bald spot. It's not genetics, it's scratching the back of your head. So we're never going to quit learning. That's right. I'm a firm believer in that. Anything I missed or should have commented on? Man, you guys are quiet today. <laughs> Think they're on information overload. Well, feel free, you know, to track me down after the talk, or if you guys have any questions. Um, I think Marsh is not around, but I'm sure she's probably thankful that you guys all showed up today. Oh, and, she's back here. Okay, so Marsh, I'm ready for you if you need to. Uh, <laughs> hey, I got a question. Yeah. You, you said about the non pareil the fertilization on them, that you know, in July, or how about the later varieties? When do you? So. I think your first application on, on any variety in that quote post harvest period is as soon as you're in the hull split and if you can shake that, that tree and you get a little of those nuts kind of starting to break loose, it's about that formation of that decision layer. So as soon as you get in the pretty much you know 50% or greater of hull split where you actually have nuts open, you can probably make your first fertigation application. The, the reason why if you can separate your non perel from your other varieties you know, if you can't, I would hold off till your last variety is into that, because we don't know if hall rot is, is it's a truly varietal difference, or if it's just the fact that our later varieties are always stressed. So that's why I'm saying maybe we want to kind of put it off instead of fertigating the whole orchard, maybe fertigating just a non-perel and then coming in and irrigating the other two, or waiting till after the late variety and just hitting it all at once okay. um, at that whole split period. I think that's the earliest you can come into an orchard. Okay. Um, and it might, you know, that last irrigation you give the trees before harvest, for example, mm -hmm. is a nice timing. I think we can come in oh, okay. and, and put a little nitrogen in. Thank you. That was a very long answer. <laughs> just, you guys got to throw stuff at me. I don't... That's okay. Are you going to have another meeting before fall? <laughs> Something fell. Um, so we have the almond um, we have the almond symposium in Kerman in June, mid-June. And I'm thinking about, I had a request from a CCA who, they're really hurting on getting CCA hours. So I was thinking about bringing down, um, trying to get some people from Davis to come down to talk about tree physiology and kind of management so we can understand how some of this stuff works. So I might be putting that on sometime in June as well. Um, where we can probably talk about some of the other issues. Like boron and stuff in the fall. Yeah, I was kind of thinking of bringing on Patrick Brown to talk about major micronutrient fertilization. That's my goal. Which, well, today would have been CCA hours for nutrition because that's what you were speaking about it. And that's where I looked at the We only had CCA, but there's no sign up. So. Okay, I'll let them. Uh, I'll, well, we'll make sure we do this late right now I mean, before we leave but because you're speaking about nutrition you get soil management, nutrition, you got five, four data categories in there. Yeah, that's true. Water, you're talking about water, that's another one. And disease management, you know. <laughs> well, disease is not so much as a CCA, I mean a PCA, but yeah. for CCA, there's water, you know, there's cultural, and uh, I get to all this. But what you're speaking about is all CCA. Yeah, the CCA hours are harder to get than PCA hours. Okay. And that the license that everybody's going to have to have in the next period of time. I, well, yeah, okay, excellent. <laughs> and we, for this, you know, because I went to the one in uh, Fireball and they should get CCA hours because that's the new CCA hours. So there's a lot of others. And and I don't know what it takes for your on your side to, to get it, you know, it's not hard, it's just another piece of paper and it probably, you know, you just kind of forget sometimes. You know, that's kind of, you wrap in the, the interesting aspect. And I think what you guys are going to see over this next probably 20, 30, 40 years of farming is all these diseases are going to be tied to irrigation and, and a lot of your, a lot of these managements, irrigation, nitrogen, disease, 
orchard longevity is all going to be tied into irrigation and nitrogen management. And you know, properly determining how to farm your trees, it's 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 always changing, and it's because we changed the system in which we we were planting our trees. We went from flood irrigation to low volume system. We went from high density or low density to high density, and all this changes the, the playing field that we're on. So it's not necessarily that we're always talking about new problems. It's just that we have to develop new ways to manage these problems within these orchards. And I just thought I would add that on because you guys have a tremendous background of experience and and you see things that are different and I just want to add that in that you please bring us in so we can help and we're only as good as you let us to be so let us become that's what I thought I'd finish with so thank you guys my sermon's over <laughs> Yeah, so many questions about PPA dollars. Okay. Matt, how are you?